on talking about this $10 billion, and it's a myth. How $10 billion of taxpayers' monies is always going towards Indians. Well, that is a myth, and it's a downright lie. Because if $10 billion indeed did go into First Nations communities, we'd be the richest of the riches in our own homeland. We wouldn't be the poorest of the poor in our own lands. Because it's $10 billion, it goes to support the 95 different federal programs with all its employees that continue to make decisions for First Nations people that live on reserves. The Department of Indian Affairs, one of, one of the biggest federal departments in addition to Health Canada, with its many, many thousands of employees, who by the way, are, many of them are not First Nations, this $10 billion goes towards that entity and continues to perpetuate colonialism, oppression, marginalization, and dependency on First Nations people. For every dollar, 10 cents goes into a community. And by the way, it's not take taxpayers' monies that goes into communities. Because in 1886, there was a trust that was created between the federal government and for First Nations, whereby the federal government entered into a trust they sign a trust agreement whereby any monies that would be generated from the land and the natural resources of First Nations lands, it would go into a trust fund that the federal government would hold in trust for First Nations to provide the funding for First Nations. So it's not taxpayers' monies. The false information, the negative images that are perpetuated by media for example, the drunken Indian, the lazy Indian, the dole on society, the burden on the taxpayer, and are always and have been and continue to be called the Indian problem. Some of you must have read about it. I know I have. I know I've been called the Indian problem. I'm a problem, all right, and I'm Indian. But I see myself as a positive problem. <laughs> Not a negative problem. But before a problem, I'm actually a human being, number one. And then when it comes to Aboriginal women or First Nations women, the media always puts up there the prostitute, the drug addict, the unfit mother, children apprehended by children's aid, Connie Jacobs' story in 1998. However, most times when it comes to non-Indian women, they are sympathized for their problems. They are sympathized for their problems of substance abuse and why they killed their children, because it's always about mental illness. So it's they rationalize. Whereas when it comes to First Nations, it's blame the victims. Blame the victims for the youth suicides. Those communities are so dysfunctional. Those Indians can't get it right. Why are their children dying? They never talk about the cause which is colonialism and assimilation. Then the murdered and missing Aboriginal women. I, my heart was very heavy a few years ago when the Ottawa Citizen had dedicated five full page coverage for a white prostitute that was murdered. And they dedicated one little paragraph when Kelly Morrison was murdered. But you know what? The white prostitute, the way it was written, she was not to be blamed for being a prostitute. She had a heart of money. But for the Indian woman, it's all her fault. It's all her fault that she's a drug addict. It's her fault that she's a prostitute. Blame the victim. And of course, when people are hearing this, or reading it, they're going to believe it. The Ottawa Citizen just recently ran a four-series exhibit of the Syrian exodus into refugee camps. When in fact there has never been any coverage and there continues to be no coverage for the exodus of First Nations people here in our homelands, from our lands, and placed on reserves. Minimal to nil to false information of the dispossession of our lands due to colonialism, due to the tar sands, to the pipelines, to mining and other resource extractions and fracking, well, where do the people go? Where do the animals go? We 
we experience exodus from our lands when they are disrupted, destroyed, and our animals are gone. It's happening right now in our backyard of the Algonquins of uh, Warrior Lake. Hair cutting. Families have been removed from their land. Courts have given them injunctions. Uh, the companies, the, the forestry companies injunction that the families cannot return back to their homelands, to their lands, to their homes. Right now in 2013. The only time a newspaper, the only time a First Nations really makes the front page cover of a newspaper or radio or TV is when there's a blockade a rally or a protest of some sort, and the most recent Chelsea book club. We're also depicted as that hostile, angry Indian. I don't know more if said the same thing about us, and whenever we're talking about environmental issues and land issues, we're more of an hostile Indian. You know, you Indians there, you should just stay home where you belong and be nice and quiet and passive and peaceful there, because then they'll love you. And give you a little bit of uh, coverage. So you want to We'll let you know. We'll tell you all about your information. The, only, the one and only time that the Ottawa citizen ever put a First Nation, an Indian person, on its very front page was August 4th, 2011, when my grandfather passed away. It was quite a bittersweet moment. I picked up that front, that the newspaper the next that morning. August 4th and I saw my grandfather. Bittersweet because we had just lost him the day before. So saddened by his death, but happy and grateful that this respectful coverage was bestowed upon him because he so rightfully deserved his honor because he was a man that had a vision of racial equality and a circle of all nations where all peoples of the world that Canada would learn the conciliation and the foundation of First Nations or Aboriginal culture. After all, we are in our own land. So what's important is that for me, as a First Nations person, is that media doesn't really tell the truth. It really needs to take time and a new approach getting out the right message, the right truth about First Nations people. I mean, media can also be a friend of First Nations. And to name but a few among the read of uh, the issues and realities, for example, Chief Spence, who went on an hour strike, and good coverage. The I don't know more, yes, there was some good coverage. The initial walkers, there was six young men that left their community and walked over a year, 1,600 uh, kilometers, just really brought unity and thousands and thousands of people gathered on Parliament Hill on March 24th, uh, sorry, 25th, 2013. And that was just so beautiful because it talked about unity. Media is uh, more and more now is bringing out, uh, talking about uh, the child welfare issue in, in a good way. Uh, First Nation rights, political matters, social issues such as the flooding, the land displacements, the environmental concerns. The imposition of government laws and its impact on First Nations, treaties, the smallpox infestation, a genocidal method that was used against our people to kill our people was the infestation of smallpox through blankets. Human uh, remains expropriation, wrongful, wrongful convictions, and police brutality. So there are, there are good media and journalists out there that work closely with First Nations people, and independent media as well. Seeking out the First Nations perspective, conducting good investigations, research, because every story has two sides. One of the most um, resourceful media source was Akwesasne Notes back in the 60s. And it was an independent First Nations owned newspaper. And it, and it brought out the realities of what was happening on reservations, what was happening in government against First Nations, the policies, the laws. And it, um, it was an excellent source, that not only for First Nations people, but for Americans and Canadians as well, because it was a First Nations perspective. And to help to raise the awareness that we are human beings, number one, 
this is our homeland, number two. And number three, there are issues here. Racist colonial policies and laws that were created against First Nations people. And how First Nations people struggle and were continuing to fight to survive. So to conclude, as stated by George Orwell, the people will believe what the media tells them they believe. Thus, in order for First Nations voices to be well represented in the media, First Nations must be included by having our perspectives front and center. In the words of the late Patricia Montour, there are alternative claims to the truth, and it is time for the formerly silenced people to be heard. Mainstream media needs to take on this approach, for it will help to alleviate racism, dispel negative images, foster reconciliation between First Nations and settlers, create nation-to-nation -nation building, thus leading to a true and healthy democracy among media for First Nations people. So ladies and gentlemen, that is my presentation in a nutshell, cut down by 30 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>